Good morning, everybody. How are you? I missed you. I haven't been live since uh, a few months, I guess. I'm Dalia Zaid. I'm founder and managing director of Forward Consultancy. What I do in simple words, we build and grow brands in uh, Middle East Africa regions. Great to be with you again. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are listening to me in the world. So what happened last year is uh, I have started this uh, live audios every Saturday at 11 a.m. since April. So did two seasons, uh, different uh, topics, uh, naturally on brand, and a little bit of the nitty gritty tactical stuff on uh, how to apply it. So we looked into um, consumer segmentation, brand ladders, uh, the role of digital media and so forth and some of the basics uh, like marketing in B2B versus B2C and some case studies and so forth. I've also taken your questions live which I really really enjoy. Uh, some of them were actually about um, uh, talent development and uh, where does the role of marketing go for you as a career development and so forth. So these have made me really very happy and uh, I want to get more of that. Now, moving on to 2024, honestly, I'm not so sure if I can be Bridget in uh, being live every uh, week. It takes a lot of time to prepare because as much as I love being with you live and taking your questions, it's just I need to always be uh, fit and alert uh, to, to make it happen and be as always on the level that you expect uh, from me. So what I'll, uh, I'll do is play by ear, uh, no commitment so far, but always um, follow the space and, um, you know, see if I'm on or not. But, but it will always be that time slot, uh, which is uh, Saturday morning, 11 a.m. Cairo time. So I'd like to welcome you again. And perhaps let me tell you where this, um, uh, you know, talk is taking us and, and uh, you know, why it was triggered or what triggered it in, in other words. So basically by the end of each year uh, and, you know, companies wrap up um, their numbers and then uh, by early this year, so in the last, I would say, three weeks, all the big ones, uh, you know, let's say um, the Nestle's of the world, Kellogg's, Kraft Heinz, Mondelez, uh, within the food uh, space, but also other uh, electronics or whatever sector, they would release their financials. Now, uh, when I was reading these things, and it's not like I wasn't aware of it, but they have all stated a huge fact is that they are uh, gaining a bit of value in their balance sheet, but the reality is the items sold are down. So in fact, they are selling less. Volume growth is really down. So between, let's say, examples of uh, Kellogg's and Kraft Heinz, they have dropped uh, from 5 to 9% in volume growth over 2023, and they do expect that to last. Inflation is all over the place. I mean, it's not a Egypt thing, it's not a regional thing, it's a global thing. For a lot of reasons, and different countries have different um, challenges. And consumers are the same. They are making these choices in their portfolio every time they have a shopping trip. And I'm sure that you uh, are aware of it. You yourself are customers. So going back to the numbers, if uh, the balance sheet of any of the big companies is showing growth in terms of value, this is not real value. It's really about the inflation. The funny thing, and, and maybe this is a side note, I don't want to derail you, but honestly, I mean, I mean, the people I, spe I speak to for the last few years since I've become a consultant are really, you know, uh, C-suite level, CEOs, investors, and some of them really surprise me that they can't read it properly. They come in with statements like, oh my God, we're doing great, blah, 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 but when you look at it, it's only value. But then you have the nitty gritties of, you know, your operations or your manufacturing, especially when you have heavy investment in a country and having that, you know, factory not working in full capacity, that's a disaster 
for any uh, company to have. You know, it's just you know static kind of capex. It's just there. Uh, it's not just about sales. It's not about marketing, but it's about the whole business. How is it doing? And then you make choices whether you're going to downsize um, your portfolio or downsize the organization. You know, many now would do um, uh, you know the job of three people because they are understaffed and for a reason. But is this the way to manage it? Absolutely not. It's hard times, sure. It's, it's not rosy. I'm not going to tell you that everything is great. It's going to continue for at least two to three years, this global down. But it's really about how you navigate it. And that's the power of leadership and management and experience. I mean, this is not new, OK? I want to just you know put Egypt aside. I'm talking here on a global level. There has been rounds. I mean, if you look at history, there has been rounds of economic downturns, that's, that's very normal, okay? And the way companies navigate that uh, are really known. I mean, it's just, you know, I would think you need to be a bit savvy and updated with your customers more than ever. You need to have a lot of collaboration. So uh, if you are not growing uh, volume-wise and you don't know how to anticipate that and you're not doing anything about it, that's basically so tough on people like, you know, um, supply chain. How do you forecast demand? How do you, you know, uh, do procurement? It could either be that you're under forecasting or over forecasting because you just don't know. But this, you know, don't know can have uh, a bit of a solution. I'll share a few thoughts on specifically volume growth. And it goes across the board, uh, developed and developing markets. It depends. I mean, if you're a global brand, you probably need to do the analysis uh, per country cluster. But there are really big, big headlines. So the obvious one, which I think everybody would go through, is promotions. But let me tell you, it's the least to me. To me, promotions uh, are bad volume and has been going on for years now. Um, globally, Nielsen has released a report about the efficiencies of uh, promotions and they said only 30% of promotions globally um, break even, okay? There are lack of efficiencies. Most uh, food and uh, beverages, I mean, you go to hypermarkets and see. So gondolas just, you know, dump uh, on it, uh, pastas, whatever, creams, milk, whatever, and that's it. It's, it, it works in short term because salespeople need to, um, you know, get their numbers, close the quarter, close the year. We understand that. It's not, a, it's, it's, it's not like a, a, a brainer, really. We know that. But long term in fixing that problem, it's not. Globally as well, uh, if you look at the numbers of promotion over the last 10 years, because of this promotion, over-promoting that practice has uh, almost 80 to 90% of customers around the world would only buy on promotion. So what are you doing as a brand? You're really killing yourself. They will never buy you to, uh, on regular price, which would mean that your equity is going down by the day. And we all know these fighter brands, they're uh, low class brands, whatever, for a certain segment of consumers, these sell. And the more you have a commodity trader uh, sort of mentality with no differentiator as a brand, you're killed. You're killed uh, in two to three years because there'll always be somebody who's cheaper than you, have a jazzy packaging, but lousy product, and where do you go from there? So again, building brands, uh, not because you know I work in that business, but truly there is a lot of proof over the years that building brands is tough. It's a, a long-term commitment. So if you're thinking that this is a quick win, no, it's not a quick win. But then it's at times as this, when you have huge inflation around the world, everything is expensive and, and really there is scrutiny from a shopper and customer perspective, what to buy today in my shopping list versus others. There are a weight of importance for a, a category. I'm sure a mom would prefer to get 
cheese versus a, a piece of chocolate. However, she knows that she needs her time for herself and me too. She probably get a smaller size of chocolate for that particular occasion versus 100 gram that she used to buy a year back because she can afford it. So the need is there is just uh, how savvy you are that you understand how to play it. So let's cut to the chase and tell you the three levers that I think uh, you should be going through and thinking thoroughly when you are redesigning your attack plan to this issue. The first one I would say is uh, price pack architectures. Now this is an analytics kind of tool. It's pretty simple. Um, I mean, Nielsen does it with a lot of money, but I think, I mean, I do it personally, manually. It's not a, a, a huge thing once you understand the logic behind it. So basically you have a portfolio with different SKUs, different sizes. So you need to understand the ratio between the price and the grammage or liters, okay? Not that the customer cares, but then, you know, that's, that's really a, a big separate conversation. But I'm trying to, to tell you here is that your portfolio needs to make sense uh, in terms of the occasion. Each SKU needs to play a role in the lives of the consumers, i.e., it has a certain occasion, a certain use. You need to understand the serving size and therefore you price it correctly. That's one thing. The other thing from that exercise when you map all the SQs in the market of yourself and your competition, direct competition, and I want to stress this part because um, many companies unfortunately get blindsided by who is your competition. They always say like, okay, if it's pasta, then it's all pasta brands. If it's oil, then it's all oil brands. Well, if you think of substitutions and you're speaking to the customers uh, day in, day out, and you have accumulation of knowledge around the occasions of use, and it is progressive. Think about snacking. And I always like to give this example, not, not because I've, I've worked like 10 years on snacking and more around the world, but years ago when we used to define snack the number one was a fruit that's the bigger context it was not chips within commercial kind of yeah chips biscuit today there is noodles today there is coffee believe it or not i mean coffee is very diversified and versatile uh, category you'd be amazed you know some people who don't want to to eat a lunch at work uh, especially ladies, would skip that by drinking a, a, a big mug of coffee. You know, this is what we call timey over until she goes home and has a meal. But then you have all of these instant, um, you know, whether soups or noodles that, you know, it's getting uh, around uh, in, in homes, in clubs, and in offices. Not everybody wants to, uh, you know, slim down or eat less, but there is a budget and uh, an average, I don't know, fast food delivery now is not less than uh, 150. If it's just, you know, one sandwich and, you know, you know the prices and I'm, I'm talking Egypt specifically. But then again, this is an exercise that goes across. So pr price pack architectures, where you are and how you can leverage the gaps. So when you map this um, SKU exercise, you will find gaps. So that gap could be a new SKU uh, and most likely would be a bigger size uh, to initiate more volume consumption and sale. And you would know probably if you've been working in fast moving consumer goods, particularly food and beverage for a long time, you would know that uh, bigger sizes blocks your competition because you know the customer had already stocked up. That's the secret and that's the game. Now the second lever would be an obvious one, which is innovation. While I say it's obvious, it's not easy. And I've wor worked on innovation, you know, tons and tons of years across categories, um, countries. The thing is, if you want a successful innovation, i.e. something that really uh, fits a need gap and is part of your ongoing portfolio forever, 
you know this is not a quick win this is not a, a a line extension this is not a new flavor you need to do it properly from ideation to commercialization which roughly i would say takes around three years yeah especially if you're doing capex uh investment and packaging and you're putting in all the right talent there to get the process of innovation correctly there's a lot of you know um BS around innovation that I've seen lately because we can't even define what innovation is. Now you, you can go back to my YouTube channel. I have tons of stuff on that. But I think one of the words that I like uh, recently is renovation. And I depicted that in a, in a talk uh, from the CEO of Nestle recently when he said, uh, yes, we will invent, uh, invest in innovation and renovation. Now, I like the word renovation because it's a quick fix if something needs to be fixed about your brand. And that is the caveat because I have seen a lot of, hey, new look, and you invest so much money in either uh, a new pack or a new design that may or may not help your brand equity and a pull. Uh, sometimes you actually need a cleanup, which gives a temporary buzz to your brand uh, it shows better in um, on shelf. Uh, it is a reason to come out there as marketeers and talk to the consumers. You have something new, but you know consumers are not stupid. They they know that this is just a, a flashy thing. Uh, you know, I I always like to give that example of you know if if you're a woman and you're just bored with your look, you go and you know dye your hair and and cut it. A, have a different cut or something and you feel good about yourself temporarily and people would you know oh you cut your hair what a nice haircut or what a nice color nice shade it suits you well but that's like two three weeks and that's about it which is fine but you know I'm, I'm giving you this example because it's a temporary thing you know at, at the end of the day uh, we always have to refer to the core which is brand equity and longevity in the market Watch out for newcomers, particularly if you're an old brand. Startups, even though they don't get this brand thing right and their niche, but they are eating share from you. And believe me, they're, I mean, if I, I don't want to really, you know, lash back at some of, of the clients I, I speak to, but, you know, it, it really surprised me that some of the basics are, are really not there. And I come back to generations of marketeers coming in and not just and not getting the basics right. It's it's very weird, and it's it's not getting them in a new place. And on the other hand, you've got you know uh, major companies and brands that have so much money to spend just to create a buzz. I mean, I I think yesterday or the day before, I have put in a comment on um, Lay's uh, in 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 the, it's it's you know the global team have put in an ad which is about a, a one minute long and it was featured uh, in the UEFA championships. Now it's very nice, okay, but you only see it once and that's it. But you know what, they have a budget. They can afford that. Whether it's going to initiate more consumption, probably not. I mean, if you're into Lay's, you will. I mean, I will not, if I'm not into chips, I will not go and buy chips. If I'm into a, another brand, I'll probably not switch to Lay's because of that. But this is this the reason they're doing that is to build equity and love yes l o v e for the brand okay and keep it memorable and which which we call saliency of the brand they don't want to keep silent and it's it's a great occasion and they have the money so you know flash it out fine but in reality how many brands in the world can do that probably you know a handful that's not a good practice either you know, so the mainstream, we, we as owners of brands, okay, let's be realistic on the table here. So we spoke about innovation, we spoke about price pack architectures. My third one, which is really going back to the basics, penetration. Yes, your route to market, how you are reaching consumers today. Let me equate that to communication. You know, uh, in the old days when you used to write a brief 20 years ago, you would say ALT and BLT, which is above the line communication and below the line communication, very classic. Today we have 
uh, I mean, not actually today for like the ten last ten years, digital marketing. Okay, it's a channel that is taking so much uh, of our um, you know engagement. We have we are on screens all the time, which is fine. But how to navigate that? So let me go back then to penetration. How are you reaching uh, the customer? Where are they in terms of actual physical customers? So look at vending machine. The first time I had a, a burger, yes, a hot burger from a vending machine was in Amsterdam about six, seven years ago. So it is a store that has fast food options and you select and you get the sandwich from the machine and it's hot. Um, but using vending machine out of, you know, the usual, you know, uh, munchables, snacking, whatever that you are desperate for when you're in airport in two o'clock in the morning. Uh, I have seen that in Moscow, for example, uh, I bought, uh, believe it or not, um, reading glasses from a vending machine, yeah? I had lost mine and I was like, uh, again, this, this must have been like 11 years ago or something because I used to work in Moscow. Uh, and to me, it was really surprising. So look at it. There are new challenge popping up, but are we using them? Uh, go back to uh, a retro. I mean, I, I told you about, you know, the next game of vending machines, but let's go back to very basic stuff. Rural areas in India. Amazon, around six, seven years ago, they tried out something called uh, the Kirana Project. Now, they realized that um, brands like, you know, um, Sunsilk, owned by, by uh, uh, Unilever, or Tang uh, by Mondelez, the brand itself is very strong and uh, people want to buy it. But there are two things, basic. One, the format and the affordability of it. So these brands have launched sachets, very affordable price point. And then the other thing, I actually can't buy it. I want it, but I can't buy it because these people are like, you know, in the grooves of the grooves of rural areas. So when Amazon mapped out they said, OK, so these guys have uh, phones, not smartphones, but just mobiles. They know about the brand, but we can't reach them. And at the same time, Amazon, with that big muscle, they cannot dig in something as rural India. I mean, I mean, if you've ever been to India, you know what I'm talking about. So what they've done is sort of recruit sub distributors until they've reached like little, I wouldn't even say kiosk. It's, it's like even smaller than kiosks. Uh, and I've seen this in South Africa as well in the, in the townships. So basically, uh, poor people, like really, really poor, uh, but they make a living from selling this stuff from uh, their home. They have a window, they open, and people would come in and, you know, have the uh, shampoo, the sachets of uh, sun silk. They would have these little eclairs. We used to, to sell them uh, at Cadbury's. And um, all of these little sachets that are affordable, and they're just next door. And all of that is then accumulated as volumes and sold by the, the sub distributor um, who would, you know, uh, where do you think that tuk tuk idea came from? It's, it's about navigating uh, the rural areas and grow. So, again, going back to, I gave you two examples one very advanced and one not too advanced at all. But that's the thing, you need to revise your channel strategy and see where are the areas where you can grow further. I mean, of course you can do frequency, but I would say go back to the basic and penetrate because frequency would need um, customers to have more money to spend when you, when you map out the uh, occasions. So um, these are the three levers, but um, Last and definitely uh, not least, um, I, would, I would go back to, again, what I started with and triggered this conversation is all of these um, annual reports coming in from uh, the big ones uh, as they wrap 2023 results. Um, 
Mark Schneider, the uh, CEO of Nestle, uh, had said something which, again, music to my ears, and I hope that uh, brand owners in this region would, would listen, the power of building brands and continuing so. Uh, he had mentioned that KitKat had delivered 14% organic growth in 2023 despite all. Why? It is a brand. Uh, there is longevity, people love it. Yes, they will be switching, of course, yeah. So what he has said and confirmed that they will continue to um, invest in marketing and uh, I wouldn't say building a brand because they're already uh, very big. They will invest in Nespresso and KitKat, the highest profitable, and they are truly powerhouse uh, as, as we always like to refer them to. So again, again, if you're a product, you will always be on a trader's mind, commodity mind, you, you, you do not click with customers, it's it's always very sad to see um, a product that has very good potential, but it's just all screwed up. Or uh, it is not so much screwed up as much as it is not well communicated because you're not focused on your differentiator, you have not understood the market well and the customer need gap. Always remember that there is very little differentiator today. It's a fact, yeah? But what is the angle that you will focus on and continue to communicate, all right? I mean, here I am, I'm a consultant. I can do tons of stuff. I mean, it, it, I've been through a lot, let me tell you that. But then, no, I, I made a choice that I do brand and retail strategy. That's it. Now, if somebody comes to me and say, oh, Dahlia, we want you your help to roll out the plan. Uh, we, we want you to structure the marketing uh, organization for us, recruit marketing people. Yeah, sure, I do that. But it's not what I communicate out there. It's by specific request for certain clients if this is the need. But I don't go out there and say, uh, hey, I do advertising. Yeah, I, I manage agency. I don't do that. So again, and by the way, this is exactly the same rationale when you build a personal brand. It's just, I don't know, it's very simple, but people don't get it. I keep saying that. But anyway, so um, we're just on time, 11.30. Um, I'm wrapping up uh, my discussion here with you. I hope you find it insightful, those three levers of volume growth. And again, of course, the devil is in the details and in application. If you feel that you have questions, you have you know, um, certain dialogue coming in your head, whether I do that or not, you know, just reach out. I'd like to help whenever. And um, if you have questions, uh, I mean, we're, we're up for time, but I mean, I can take a, a few questions or comments if you like so. Um, just, you know, um, you know, raise your hand if so. Uh, if not, by the way, uh, this session will be uh, on my YouTube channel, um, you know, maybe tomorrow or something. So you can either share it or listen to it again. And um, I'm actually, I'm happy to see familiar faces in the audience. Uh, so do you have questions, guys, uh, comments? If not, we can wrap it up here and wish you a lovely, lovely rest of the day.